Now that we have an understanding of quotient groups, link in the description to my lesson introducing them, it's a good time to look at some cool examples of quotient groups. For our first example, we'll let G be an abelian group and let H consist of all finite order elements in G. We're going to consider the quotient group of G by H, but to do that we first must show that H is indeed a normal subgroup. Thankfully, you may recall we've previously proven that for an abelian group, all of its subgroups are normal subgroups, so all we have to prove is that H is a subgroup of G. Then it follows that it is a normal subgroup, and so we can take the quotient group. To prove that H is a subgroup of G, we'll first show that H is non-empty, and then we'll show that for any two elements A and B from H, the product AB inverse is also in H. Clearly, H is non-empty because it contains the identity element of G, because H contains all finite order elements of G, and by definition, the identity element has order 1. That's a finite order, so the identity is in H and it is non-empty. Hence, we can take two elements, say A and B, from H. Since they're in H, of course, they must have finite order. Let's say the order of A is equal to M, and the order of B is equal to N. Then we'll consider the product A times B inverse. If we can show that's in H, that will establish that H is a subgroup of G. This is the one-step subgroup test. Link in the description if you want to check out my video on that. So this product, AB to the negative 1, we're going to raise this to the power of m times n. That's, of course, a finite power. We're going to show that this equals the identity, hence establishing that the order of this product must be finite, and thus the product must belong to H. Now, by our exponent laws, we could distribute these exponents, m times n, we could bring those down into the parentheses to A and B inverse, but because the order of A is M, let's do this in a special way. Let's just take the M into the parentheses with A and leave the N outside. And then for B, the order is N. So we'll take N inside the parentheses for B and also move that negative 1 outside of the parentheses. Thus, we have A to the M to the power of N times b to the n to the power of negative m. Of course, a to the m is the identity because the order of a is m, and b to the n is also the identity because the order of b is n. Thus, this becomes e to the n times e to the negative m. Of course, that's just the identity element. Since we've shown that there is a finite number, we can raise AB inverse to the power of in order to produce the identity. The order of AB inverse is certainly finite, and so it is an element of H. Obviously, it's an element of G because G is a group, and so since it has finite order, it's also an element of H. So we've established that H is a subgroup of G, and since G is abelian, that means that H is a normal subgroup, and so we may consider the quotient group of G by H. Now, our claim, which is what makes this quotient group interesting, is that the only finite order element in the quotient group is going to be the identity the coset H times the identity. That's the identity element of the quotient group. And we claim that's the only one in the quotient group that has finite order. Let's prove it. Let's say we take a coset HX from G by H so that HX has finite order. Thus, HX to the M equals the identity H for some positive integer M. Then, of course, by definition of coset multiplication, HX to the M that's the same as h x to the m. So h x to the m must equal h. Again, h is the identity element of the quotient group. So we have then that x to the m is an element of h, because of course h is a subgroup, it contains the identity, and so one of the elements is the identity times x to the m, which is x to the m. So x to the m is an element of h. And thus, x to the m has finite order. And so, x to the m to the t is equal to the identity for some positive integer t. But then, by our exponent rules, if x to the m to the t is the identity, 
That means that x to the m times t is the identity. But then that means x has finite order, because we can raise x to the power of some finite number, m times t, to produce the identity. Since x has finite order, it must be an element of h. But if x is an element of h, the identity coset, well, we know that cosets partition the group. So if x is in h, then the coset hx, which also contains x, must equal h. Cosets can't have overlap unless they are completely equal. So again, since x is an element of h, we know that the coset hx must be equal to h. And so what you should see here is that we took a coset, we assumed it had finite order, and that forced it to equal the identity coset of h. And so we've established our claim that the only finite order element in the quotient group g by h is the identity h, or h times e, however you want to look at it. Of course, the identity element of a group will always have finite order, but we see by taking the quotient group of g by that subgroup h, which contains all the finite order elements, we have, in a sense, factored out all of the finite order elements. The only one that remains in the quotient group is the one that would have to be there, which is the identity, but there are none other that are left. Our second example has a similar flavor. We're going to let G be a group, and we need to be familiar with this idea of a commutator of a group. A commutator of a group G is an element of this form, A, B, A inverse, B inverse, where A and B are both in G. These are called commutators because an element of this form equals the identity if and only if A and B commute. Otherwise, it will not equal the identity. With that in mind, we're going to let H be the normal subgroup of G, where H contains all the commutators of G. Remember that the commutators are any elements of this form, not just the ones that equal the identity. So for two elements A and B that don't commute, their commutator is going to be some other element, but that is still a commutator, so long as it's of this form. So we're putting all the commutators in this subgroup, H. I'll leave a link in the description to my lesson where we go over commutators and show that the set of commutators is a normal subgroup. For this video, we'll just assume that this group H is indeed a normal subgroup of G, and the claim is that the quotient group G by H is abelian. To prove this, let's take two cosets from the quotient group, say HX and HY. Then, Note that hx times hy, by definition of coset multiplication, is equal to hxy. Similarly, hy times hx is equal to hyx. And so we seek to prove that hxy equals hyx. If we can establish that, then we've established that this quotient group is abelian. We previously proved this result about cosets, that a coset HA is equal to a coset HB if and only if AB inverse is an element of H. I'll leave a link in the description to my lesson proving that, but applying that result to this context, we have that HXY will equal HYX, which is what we want to prove, if and only if xy times yx inverse is an element of h. And so it remains for us to prove that xy times yx inverse is an element of h. But we see that xy times yx inverse, if we know how to take the inverse of a product of elements, this is actually just the commutator xy x inverse y inverse, right? It's sometimes called the socks and shoes property to take the inverse of a product. We take the inverse of the product in the reverse order. So this is in fact just the commutator, which we know is in H by H's definition. H contains all the commutators. Since xy yx inverse is in H, we have that hxy equals hyx, hence the cosets commute. So this quotient group of G by H is abelian. Its elements can be multiplied in any order without altering the product. Now, all of those commutators that we put in H, with the exception of the identity, in a sense represent elements that don't commute. The more distinct commutators we have, the less 
commutative or the less abelian a group is. So what we see is if we take all those commutators, stuff them in a subgroup H, and then take the quotient group G by H, we in a sense factor out all the commutators and leave behind an abelian group. In the quotient group G by H, the only commutator is the trivial identity. Here's one more example involving the center of a group. You should know the center of a group G is the normal subgroup C of G, consisting of all elements of G, which commute with every element of G. So it only contains elements which can be multiplied with the rest of G in any order. Again, I'll leave a link in the description to my lesson going over the center of a group in more detail and proving that it is indeed a normal subgroup. We'll take that for granted here and consider the quotient group of G by C where again, C is the center. Now, if G by C is a cyclic group generated by some coset from the quotient group, then it follows that G is abelian. Say that again, if we take the center of a group and then consider the quotient group of G by C, that center, if that quotient group is cyclic, meaning it's generated by one of the cosets, say CA, in the quotient group, then G is abelian, and we'll prove that now. We'll begin by taking one arbitrary element X from the group and consider its corresponding coset C times X. We know that the quotient group G by C is generated by the coset CA. So some power of CA must equal this coset CX. Let's say CA to the M equals CX for some positive integer M. Thus, by definition of exponents for cosets, we have that c a to the m is equal to c x. And so there exists some element c in the center so that c a to the m is equal to x. This is because c x, of course, contains x. So in order for these cosets to be equal, there must be some element little c in the set c so that little c times a to the m is equal to x. That's the only way these two cosets could be equal. Knowing that to be the case, we can now take a second element from g, let's call it y, and we could apply all the same logic we just did considering a corresponding coset cy and all that, and arrive at y equals c prime a to the n for some element c prime from the center, and some positive integer n. So all the logic that got us this equation for x, we just apply that same logic to y and get this equation, where instead of c, we have this other element from the center, c prime, and instead of the exponent m, we have this other exponent, n. Now we're going to use these equations to show that x and y commute. Remember, x and y are just arbitrary elements from the group G. So considering x times y, then applying these equations, we can rewrite it as a to the n times c times c prime times a to the n. Now remember that c is from the center of G, so we can swap the order in which we write a to the m times c. We can just put the c first, and we can drop the parentheses by the associativity property. So we rewrite this as c times a to the m times c prime times a to the n. Both c and c prime are from the center, so we can both shift those around as we like because they commute with all elements of G. So let's move the c to the end and bring c prime out to the front. Thus, we have c prime, a to the m, a to the n, c. Now, a to the m and a to the n are just a bunch of factors of a, so order there doesn't really even mean anything. So there's no problem swapping the order in which we write those. So we could rewrite this as c prime times a to the n times a to the m times c. Then put this in parentheses, c prime a to the n times a to the m times c, Clearly, by our previous equations, this here on the left is y, and this here on the right is x. And so we've written xy as y x. And so by applying associativity, knowing that c and c prime are from the center, and of course taking advantage of that being just a bunch of a's, we're able to swap the order of x and y without changing the product. And so we've proven that this quotient group of the group by its center 
being cyclic, forces the group to be abelian. So those are a few interesting examples of quotient groups. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions, and be sure to check out my Abstract Algebra course and Abstract Algebra Exercises playlists in the description for more. If you find my videos helpful, please consider supporting what I do by joining Wrath of Math as a channel member. You can get early and exclusive access to additional videos and extra practice, and if you join at the premium tier or above, you can access the lecture notes used in my courses. Thanks for watching. Oh,